Welcome to the basic science course in chemistry. I am Anindya Datta, Department of Chemistry, IIT Bombay, and uh, I and my colleagues are delighted to be a part of this initiative, which we sincerely hope will prove to be highly beneficial for first year undergraduate students across the country. So, in this course, we are going to take you through some uh, rudiments of chemistry that uh, you have studied to some extent in 11, 12 perhaps, but uh, now we will try to answer questions that might have come to your mind while studying this in school. And this is something that is going to prepare the field for further studies no matter uh, which branch of engineering or science uh, you are in at the moment. We will start our discussion with atomic structure, but before that let me give a credit where it is due. Uh, in my part, most of the things that we are going to talk about come from uh, this course that we teach to our first year undergraduate BTEC and BS students. It is called CH107 Physical Chemistry, but it is by and large about quantum chemistry. Now, this course has developed over many, many years with a lot of contribution from many different people, the ones that you see now on your screen. So, a lot of effort has gone in to build the contents and that is what has given uh, the course the shape it now is in. So, let me begin with a word of thanks to all these colleagues of mine and also to the students, the teaching assistants who have participated in this course and the students who we have taught. Uh, many of the things that we are going to discuss today have actually uh, arisen out of our attempts to answer questions asked by our students and then we felt that this should be taught. So, that is how we learn together. It is not as if uh, it is one way traffic. With that uh, very, very brief forward, let us now uh, say that what your textbooks are going to be. You already have a textbook given to you, but uh, in addition to that, I would like to recommend Physical Chemistry by Ira Levine. Macquarie and Simon is uh, in my opinion the best book in this genre if you want to study physical chemistry in a little more detail and we will not have to refer to Pillar and Macquarie too much in this course. This is these are only as reference books for those who want to learn a uh, little more uh, beyond this course. We sincerely hope that we will be able to rouse the curiosity among some of you so that you will want to know more about quantum chemistry. For them Pillar and Macquarie's quantum chemistry books are recommended. Another book that I find two books that I find to be very useful are uh, Quantum Chemistry by Prasad and Quantum Chemistry by A. K. Chandra. In fact, the first book I studied on quantum chemistry was the one by A. K. Chandra when I was a student. So, the question that we try to answer in this part of the course is something that mankind has asked forever and the question is what is everything made up of? In our ancient Indian culture, it was felt it was thought, it was believed that everything is made up of five elements of Panchabhut that most of us would know about. Little philosophical way of answering this question, but actually makes sense. If you think of it in a qualitative manner, Panchabhut is uh, perhaps the best explanation that could have come at that time. In ancient Chinese civilization, Everything was believed to be made up of two opposing forces, yin and yang, good and bad, up and down, so on and so forth. Even that do, does make sense uh, even today. As we come to the modern understanding of structure of an atom, you will see that there are two uh, completely opposite things that are play there, at play there. Of course, uh, with advent of time, by, that, by now all of us know that it is not 5 elements or 2 elements, but in chemistry we have uh, many elements 108, 118 what is the current number? Uh, I leave that uh, to you to find out. And uh, in high school I think we have all studied this periodic table which is a nice systematic arrangement of all these elements that allow us to uh, sort of rationalize their properties to a very great extent. But then uh, our question does not stop there element fine, let us take any one element, let us take iron or let us take hydrogen or whatever. Suppose I take a piece of iron and suppose we keep uh, breaking it down, make smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. The question is uh, do I stop somewhere? 
or can I keep on making smaller and smaller pieces. Again in ancient Indian uh, civilization an answer to this was provided by a scholar whose name is believed to be Kanad. And Kanad actually had said that everything is made up of things like Anu, small fundamental particles. And that was uh, resonated much later in uh, Dalton's atomic theory that all of us would have studied in class 8 or something, that everything is made up of atoms. So, hence we go to the concept of atoms and molecules, but our question does not stop there. So, the question that was there is Dalton thought atoms are indivisible, are they really indivisible? As we know that uh, towards the end of 19th century by many experiments like this uh, cathode ray experiment, the existence of subatomic particles was established. So, they were called electrons. And then of course, uh, if something that is negatively charged is present in an atom, it has to be balanced yin, yin and yang remember, it has to be balanced by something that is positively charged. So, protons and eventually neutrons were discovered as well. So, the next question was how were all these subatomic particles arranged in the atom? Again uh, many uh, attempts were made to answer this question. Uh, one of them had that had some prom had some prominence was this Thomson's plum pudding model where it was believed that the positive charge is delocalized over the atom and the negative charge is uh, embedded in this cloud spherical cloud of positive charges. Well, this did not hold water because uh, I mean why would that happen? Why do we not get annihilation? But even this gives us an idea of delocalized charge we are saying spherical cloud of positive charge right. So, this charge cloud is something that we go back to eventually we will come to that. But all this mostly was a philosophical discussion except for uh, this uh, periodic table subatomic particles Dalton dynamic theory those these things. The first very very important experiment in my opinion that came towards unraveling the structure within an atom was performed by uh, a student of Rutherford actually his name was Marston. The experiment that was formed that was performed was at that time alpha particles had been uh, discovered already and it was known that they are very highly energetic particles. So, Rutherford asked Marston to do the simple experiment take an alpha particle emitter keep a gold foil in front of it and then see how many alpha particles go through straight and try to see whether there is any deviation in the path of the alpha particles. How would you know if alpha particles go straight or they bend a photographic film was placed in the circular manner. And this kind of a chamber is what was actually used for the experiment. So, the alpha particle emitter would be here, gold foil would be here and in this empty place the photographic film would be placed. In fact, this kind of chambers are used for modern experiments even now. So, it was expected that everything would go through straight because alpha particles are so very highly energetic and gold foil is so thin. And the observation was that it is true that most of them went through straight, but some of them did get deviated and 1 in 20,000 would turn back. So, these arrows that you see here they sort of denote in a cartoon notation what kind of paths are taken by the alpha particles. 1 in 20,000 actually turn back. A result that is very very easy to neglect or push over saying there is a freak result. The greatness of Rutherford and the courage of Marston was that they took this result seriously and hence this Rutherford model was proposed. What is the model? The model is that all the positive charge and most of the mass of the atom is uh, at one point, a point that is called nucleus and the rest of the atom is uh, practically a void that is why alpha particles go through straight. But then what about the electrons they have to be in this void space, but if they are stationary then they would be attracted by the nucleus and they would just fall upon the nucleus and get annihilated. To explain this Rutherford invoked a planetary model. It is known that planets go around the st their stars right earth goes around the sun 
learning from that example Rutherford proposed that these uh, electrons actually go around the nucleus in circular orbits. And when they do so the centrifugal force would exactly balance the electrostatic attraction and that is what Rutherford expected would keep the electron from falling into the nucleus and resulting in annihilation of the atom. Makes sense right nice model. The problem was that uh, from classical electrodynamics it is expected that a charged particle in motion would keep on emitting energy. So, two problems with that if you look at the emission spectrum emission spectrum means look at the light that comes out and see what is the intensity of light coming out of a particular color. So, if this is the situation that uh, you have an electron that is moving a charged particle in motion it would give out energy continuously then you expect what is called a continuous spectrum you would have all colors no demarcation clear demarcation between two bands. Unfortunately as we are going to say a little later uh, it is known that for elements the emission spectrum actually has uh, discrete nature we get what is called line spectra. Besides the problem is if the electron actually emits energy continually then it is going to lose energy right. So, initially you start from a situation where some centrifugal force is there it is balancing then when it loses energy then it would move slower centrifugal force would be lesser. So, it would be drawn in a little closer. So, this way it would actually go round and round in a spiral and fall onto the nucleus and if you do that calculation you will see that the time required for an electron to fall into the nucleus is something like picosecond 10 to the power minus 12 second. So, that does not give you a stable atom. So, that is why Rutherford model could not really make too much of headway, but it was an excellent start. Please understand that uh, the experimental result is actually correct. It is true that there is a nucleus, it is true that the electron is in the uh, mostly void space of the atom, but what is not true is that electron is going around in circles. To address the situation it required the uh, guts of Niels Bohr, but you know uh, no invention no discovery no new observation comes without prior knowledge by and large. So, even Bohr had help and the help came in a series of fascinating observations made in physics towards the end of 19th century and beginning of 20th century. One of them we have already discussed right we said that uh, we have line spectra of atoms we already said that. Another one was black body radiation we have studied black body radiation in physics in class 11 and 12 I guess. So, uh, you might be familiar with this kind of a diagram where you plot the energy distribution against wavelength this is called a spectrum it was known that if you increase the temperature the spectrum becomes sharper and more intense and the maximum moves towards smaller wavelength that is higher energy. Why does that happen? To explain it uh, there is something called Rayleigh Jeans model they tried to explain it by using classical oscillators within the cavity of the black body and they failed they encountered what is called ultraviolet catastrophe. So, uh, Rayleigh Jeans considered a uh, large number of oscillators oscillating at whatever frequency each can have its own frequency and their distribution is expected to give the distribution that you observe in the spectrum. Unfortunately, Rayleigh Jeans model can nicely map the spectrum at longer wavelength, but it gives a monotonic increase this turnaround is not there in Rayleigh Jeans model. So, to answer this question Planck proposed another model and he found that the only way you can actually provide a theoretical description of the spectrum of a black body is to consider that energy is quantized rho here is energy density. So, you see something called like e to the power h c by lambda k t there hence we get e equal to n h nu that means energy is quantized uh, these oscillators can only take up some certain fixed values of energies integral multiples of h nu where h is a constant called Planck's constant very small number I will leave it to you to find out what the value is and n is uh, 0 1 2 3 this kind of a number ok that cannot be negative 0 and positive numbers whole numbers. So, 
Quantization is something that had already come in an attempt to explain this experimental observation that was one beginning. Another beginning was this line spectra. So, what you see here is uh, x axis is wavelength and you get a line well the color is something that is added later actually these are black and white photographs. But what you do essentially is that you uh, place a prism or a grating in path of light that comes out of the atom and you disperse it. Remember dispersion Newton's experiment you uh, take sunlight and put it through a prism it breaks down into what we call 7 colors. So, here the emission uh, emitted light from an atom is made to go through a prism and it breaks down into component colors. What you expect from Rutherford model is something that is shown in the top a continuous spectrum. What you actually get is discrete lines for sodium these are the lines for hydrogen these are the lines in fact there are more we will talk about that later for calcium, magnesium, neon. So, discrete lines which means that uh, only certain uh, packets of energy are coming out of these atoms another signature of quantization. So, to explain these lines what one can do is one can write an empirical equation like this for each of these spectral lines here wherever they occur the wavelength 1 by lambda or wave number is given by r infinity r infinity is called Rydberg constant multiplied by 1 by n 1 square minus 1 by n 2 square where n 1 and n 2 are 2 integers 1 2 3 4 so on and so forth completely empirical. Okay. The question is why where does this come from and Rydberg constant you see is we have written it up to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 decimal places. So, we can actually determine it to 5 decimal places that is the point. It is touted to be the most accurately determined physical constant right and this is the uh, these are the lines for Balmer series you see Balmer series easier because it is in the visible range. But I think you might know that th there are actually more Lyman, Balmer, Bastian, Bracket, Fun in different areas different regions of electromagnetic spectrum. But all of them can be actually explained by this kind of a formula the question is why. So, to explain why and knowing that Rutherford model does not really go too far uh, Bohr said that I do not know why, but I can see very clearly that energies of an electron in an, in an atom have to be quantized. And what he figured was that the angular momentum has to be quantized m v r equal to n h by 2 pi. Now, why angular momentum has to be quantized that can be explained later when we talk about de Broglie hypothesis there is something called de Broglie wavelength associated with the electron. So, in order to have constructive interference in the wavelength this is the condition that has to be satisfied. The interesting thing is from here Bohr could uh, work out an expression for energy which turns out to be minus m e e to the power 4 by 8 epsilon 0 square h square into 1 by n square. Do you have to remember this? No. Please remember 1 by n square that is all that is required. Uh, there is no need to remember the uh, uh, constant. What is important is that the energy expression has something in n square in the denominator. So, now uh, what Bohr said is that as long as uh, this condition is satisfied that m v r equal to n h by 2 pi we have what he called stationary states stationary not as in electron is not moving stationary in energy energy of electron does not change where when they are in the stationary state that is what he meant. And then what he said is that there are certain allowed stationary states each is associated with a uh, quantum number n which is 1 2 3 so on and so forth. So, what would be the energies of this uh, states Maybe I will just draw even though it is drawn here you might get confused because the orbits are shown if I just draw the energies let us say this is the energy of the lowest level n equal to 1. Whatever its value is energy for n equal to 2 what will that be remember there is a minus sign. So, it will actually go up and the proportionality will be 1 by n square ok 4 4 times and then we have n equal to 3. So, these are the different energy levels that are there and it is constant multiplied by 1 constant multiplied by 1 by 4 constant multiplied by 1 by 9 and so on and so forth. 
So, these are the stationary states. Now, suppose an electron is there in n equal to 3 that is an excited state it has to come down to the ground state or something. How does it come? When it jumps Bohr said when it jumps from one stationary state to other the energy difference delta E is emitted and this delta E is equal to H nu. So, that is uh, what is said by Bohr delta E is equal to H nu. So, now when you equate this delta E to H nu you see you get 1 by n 1 square minus 1 by n 2 square what we have written is n i square minus 1 by n i square minus 1 by n f square i for initial f for final and that if you remember is exactly the same form as uh, Rydberg equation and from here the Rydberg constant that is calculated is in agreement with the experimental determined Rydberg constant to that 7th place of or 6th place of decimal. And the other thing that was calculated using this was the ionization potential of hydrogen atom which turns out to be 13.6 electron volt. So, Bohr theory gives us uh, very good values of energy. But then when people took a closer look at it, it turned out that Bohr theory was incomplete. So, with better spectrometers it was found that the uh, spectral lines that were thought to be one are actually many this is what is called fine structure. To explain this Sommerfeld did an extension of Bohr model taking hints from Einstein's work. Now plenty of uh, non mathematical popular literature is available on Bohr model and Sommerfeld model I encourage you to read those. So, what Sommerfeld said was that corresponding to each value of n it is not necessary that the orbits are always circular. You can have elliptical orbits. And depending on the ellipticity of the orbits the energies will change a little bit it will not be just dependent on n this secondary quantum number k is what Sommerfeld used that is also going to have some effect on the energy. Then uh, the Zeeman effect experiment was done magnetic field was applied and it was found that now the uh, spectral lines increase in number you have splitting of spectral lines that was explained by saying that you have situation like this for any given value of n and k combination it is not necessary that there is only one circular well there is only one elliptical orbit. Okay. You can have more than one and the number is 12 plus 1 where L is the modified secondary quantum number. So, uh, the range goes from plus L to minus L. So, here we see 1, 2, 3. 3 orbits. So, plus 1, 0, minus 1. So, for this the uh, L value is actually 1 and magnetic quantum number m values are 1, 0, minus 1. And if we have this uh, orbits that are oriented in different direction discrete different directions angular momentum vector is perpendicular to the plane of the orbit right. So, that angular momentum vector can also take up discrete orientations in space this is called space quantization. I am going a little fast because I think you have studied all this in uh, class 11, 12. And how many uh, values of m can be there that was also determined that you can have 12 plus 1 values. So, what does m determine? m determines the z component of angular momentum remember we are going to come back to this. So, this model uh, gave rise to a uh, lot of excitement you can see this kind of picture in many places including the logo of our department of atomic energy. However, end of the day this model had to be scrapped. Why? Because first of all uh, it is evident that Bohr theory by itself is incomplete you make a new observation you have to extend it that is a problem. Secondly the major tool that Bohr used was calculus integration which is the tool of uh, classical mechanics. So, on one hand you are saying that classical mechanics does not work but you use its tool as long as it works the moment you it does not work you say that classical mechanics does not work. So, there is a little bit of dichotomy here. But the most important objection against Bohr theory ok spin is something that I did not talk about we will talk about that later. The biggest problem of Bohr theory came from uh, Eisenberg's work. Eisenberg showed that for uh, atomic particles subatomic particles this kind of uncertainty holds uncertainty in position multiplied by uncertainty in momentum has to be greater than or equal to h by 4 pi. So, you cannot determine the position and momentum accurately 
like what Bohr model tries to do. So, Bohr model is too deterministic in nature and remember uncertainty principle is not about uh, not being able to do the right experiment. It is about a natural threshold something that you cannot cross no matter how good an instrument you build. Right? If you uh, study uh, higher level courses in quantum physics or quantum chemistry uh, you will learn more about uncertainty principle. But for now let us just say that uncertainty principle was the final nail in the coffin of Bohr model. So, even though it gives us uh, very good agreement with many experimental results one has to discard Bohr theory and move on to uh, something else look for something else. In fact, this uncertainty principle gave rise to a lot of interest beyond the world of science. So, you get you uh, so this kind of cartoons and all uh, came up, but uh, the biggest problem is that uh, uncertainty principle says that you cannot really continue with this nice logic that we have of the classical world you cannot take it too deep into the quant into uh, atomic world. So, Bohr model has to be discarded you have to look for something else and this something else was provided by Schrodinger in his famous equation this is what we will discuss in the next module.